Well, welcome to today's webinar, A Documentary History of the United States with Alexander Hefner. I'm Mari Kirk, Director of Engagement and Impact here at the United States Study Center. Um, just before we begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia, the University of Sydney stands on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on, and pay respects to their elders past, present, and future. And in an age dominated by terms like fake news and disinformation, what are the facts about the history of the United States? Uh, to take a look at what we learned from primary sources, it is my great pleasure to welcome Alexander Hefner today. Uh, his grandfather, Richard Hefner, published the first edition of a documentary history of the United States back in 1952. It looked at original sources from Thomas Paine's Common Sense to the US Constitution, to the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and in later editions, he added additional sources like Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. He handed over both the book and his PBS show, The Open Mind, to his grandson, Alexander, who updated recent editions of the book and is launching the 11th edition now. And in this updated edition, uh, Alexander picks up from the Trump tweets covered in uh, edition 10, uh, but now includes documents by Liz Cheney, President Biden, the Movement for Black Lives, and new selections from Frederick, Frederick Douglass, among others. Uh, this unvarnished examination of original contemporaneous sources could not be more relevant as the world watches the current autopsy of American democracy unfolding in the January 6 hearings at the moment. Um, it's available for order here in Australia from amazon.com.au or online from dimmix.com.au. And I believe stores uh, like Dimmix and Glee Books will also be stocking copies soon. Um, but Alexander, over to you. Could you uh, just please tell us a little bit about the book and what it means to you personally? Absolutely. Um, and thank you for that warm introduction. I recall fondly my time with university professors across disciplines um, for your post-truth initiative um, with um, Nick Enfield and others um, who I know are, are continue to be dedicated to that pursuit of a fact-based democratic future for Australia and the, the rest of us. <clears throat> the, the process started when my grandfather asked me to help him update the eighth edition. Um, and at that point, I don't think the book fully reflected the contemporary media cycle and specifically the role of television. Uh, and when I say the role of television, I'm thinking of the Iraq war and specifically the prosecution of that war and how um, not just through print media, but through the embedding of military, um, there was a, um, an argument for war. Um, following the 9-11 attacks um, and then ultimately, you know, the justification for the war was made in frequent interviews on Sunday morning TV shows. And that history wasn't fully represented. So we together decided to include interviews with Jim Lair and Bob Schieffer on PBS and CBS of Vice President Cheney, um, which to us was the foundation of the argument for regime change and having to hold ourselves accountable for what that invasion meant in terms of lives lost and morale lost. Um, so it, would, it, it was my suggestion to use that kind of untraditional document of broadcast interviews. Uh, and then that was the first of its kind in the book. And then subsequently, he asked me to continue the, the book project when he was gone. Um, as major events unfolded in the United States. So you all know in the audience, um, whether you're American or Aussie or whatever, um, that we've had our share of news internationally, the pandemic. Um, but of course, prior to the pandemic, the election of Donald Trump, um, which I note in the essay in the 10th edition, um, was really a remarkable event because it was the first time in US history where someone who had no governing experience in the military, in public service, became president. Um, 
there have been, you know, many presidents before him. Um, in a lot of respects, the commentary on Trump as unprecedented is, is very accurate. Um, and so that addition reflected the unprecedented nature of Trump's presidency, the beginning of a kind of post-factual anti-democratic streak in populism, and also covered the, you know, the economic experience of the United States in highlighting the movements, not only of Donald Trump, but Bernie Sanders. And so the 10th edition that I updated, the first one that I updated on my own, spoke to the political devolution, evolution in our country over the years following the Obama administration, which was our final update together of the two updates we did. Um, now, as I embarked on this 11th edition, uh, the publisher and I both felt that we needed to more adequately represent the American story. Uh, as I say in the introduction to this edition in the essay, our original sins and our moral triumphs um, in the you know, ever complicated journey of the United States. And I think we ought to embrace as historians that complicatedness um, and not shy away from looking for clarity, both in terms of um, the, you know, the, the high standards we aspire to hold ourselves to in some of the fine founding documents in our country, and then the realities of where and when we met those standards. And, uh, and so this edition included not only updates on the pandemic and the insurrection, but uh, throughout the book, speeches that offered a more diverse and I, I think necessarily diverse representation of, of our country. Um, so Frederick Douglass, what does the 4th of July mean to me? An incisive speech um, that ought to be taught along the Constitution or the Declaration in any environment um, where a, a man um, who has seen, you know, people enslaved on the basis of color, on the basis of race, um, try to grapple with what it meant um, that only a sliver of, of uh, his brethren were, were free, and, and yet um, there was the enslavement still of an entire race of people, um, and grappling with the unfulfilled promises of those founding documents. So Douglas is one example. Um, it's not the only example of updates to the book. We can explore that together, and I'm excited to answer your questions and, and those questions of the attendees. Um, but it was also important for me to capture uh, the, the present, and, uh, and that is done in various ways. Most notably, I think the New England Journal of Medicine, for the first time in the history of that publication, which is, as you know, considered a gold standard for uh, scientific-based investigation and, and uh, medical surveys of drugs and studies. Um, it, was, it was the first time ever that they editorialized um, watching the death cycle of, their, of our fellow countrymen and women during the pandemic and what they called the, the vast void of leadership during that period. Um, and then, you know, ultimately traveling through the first impeachment of Donald Trump, um, which of course we know impeached, not convicted. The second impeachment impeached, also not convicted. Uh, and telling the story of how one impeachment led to the next Im impeachment. Uh, and I think that's, in, that's important to, to understand. You know, the threat of withholding aid to Ukraine ultimately leading to um, not just domestic insecurity with the violations of our peaceful transfer of power in this country, but beyond that, the geopolitical implications of what uh, then President Trump was attempting to do to set the stage for uh, a relationship with Russia that would be very different had he been reelected or had he attempted more, even more forcefully to remain in office. Um, so this edition tells the story. The last issue or edition was called Democracy Under Duress. And this is you know, an era or age of 
insurrection and pandemic. Um, and, um, and, and I think it, it may actually, thinking about the current hearings, it, it may leave us on a more hopeful note you know, than, than the, the past edition. Is the past edition at the very end, I asked the question of whether the United States was devolving into a kind of authoritarian state. Um, and I, in my mind, saw emanating from the 2016 election and the events subsequent um, that the plutocracy that was taking shape unaccountable to the democratic will of the people was not so much a liberal plutocracy or a conservative plutocracy. It, it threatened to be uh, an authoritarian um, form of government and, and never before had conservatism, mainstream conservatism in the modern era or mainstream liberalism become so attached to or conflated with an anti-factual um, propaganda that is seeking to uplift, uh, you know, a totalitarian regime. And, and that's how I think a lot of people view the insurrection. Um, but with that, I will stop and answer more questions. Yeah, no, that's great. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I definitely want to pick up on January 6th and also the different sources that you've uh, added for this 11th edition. Um, but just to pick up on an earlier point where you talked about how you kind of led the pivot uh, in terms of the sources the book looks at uh, from just being that traditional kind of hard copy, pen on paper sort of document. Uh, and then looking at, you know, TV and what we see there. And now it's introduced things like tweets and other digital sources. Um, do you believe there's a difference in the nature of original sources, either in the substance itself or in how it's perceived? Uh, when you make the switch from a hard copy source, like historic letters, laws, declarations, uh, to digital sources like tweets? It's a great question. I said in interviews I did for the last edition that I regretted having to include tweets, um, but they were actually governing decisions in 140 or 280 characters. And so you just can't exclude the historical record, even if you think it lacks the proper context or evidence. And even if you're gonna debunk it and say, you know, as was the case with the argument for weapons of mass destruction, we were all afraid after 9-11. There was an argument being made advanced that the Hussein regime possessed these weapons and was a threat to not just the region, but world order. And then ultimately, you know, they were not you know, located. And then there was also evidence of the, of the connection between al-Qaeda and, and Iraq that was not accurate and was presented as accurate at various points. So I don't see it necessarily as a historical lapse or change that um, politicians are going to cherry pick evidence or they're going to make an argument, even if it's on the basis of little to, to no flimsy you know, evidence. Um, I think in this case, it was just a further reduction of any knowledge-based decision-making or exploration of the subject. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's, there, there is a qualitative difference in that you can't expose, you know, contradictions in, in a tweet as easily if someone is if basically saying the sky is not blue, you know, the sky is green or purple or, or whatever. Um, you know, there, there is there is a certain echo chamber that forms that is not even open, opening the door to discussion, deliberation, debate, right? And that's just the nature of the way President Trump used Twitter. Now, a future president, whether it's President Biden now or other presidents in the future, they don't have to deploy that kind of um, absolute tyrannical statements that are often statements of falsehoods, but that's how they were being deployed. And therefore you can't interrogate them as a source in the same way. And you certainly can't expect from them the degree of nuance or sophistication as 
a John Adams speech or a Charles Sumner speech or even a Ronald Reagan speech. I mean, so I, I think many of us felt um, there was such a radical transformation in the way that information was being processed, not just by the nation, but by the commander in chief moving from Obama, President Obama to President Trump, how, how it was being shared with the country um, and how the country was processing it surely were different and, uh, and therefore they're qualitatively different as sources, um, but they can't be ignored as having impact or consequence. Um, we know that President Trump likely could have sent tweets um, following the speech, the pre-insurrection speech, he could have sent tweets um, and of course, he could have been in the situation room, which now we see he was not the situation room for those outside of the US where often you're gathering with your head military officers and uh, you know top deputies. And it, we know that the, the military was not deployed to stop the rioters and insurrectionists. And so, you know, it, it may have been that, you know, if Donald Trump had had tweeted forcefully, you know, that, that, that these acts were going to be punished, that this vandalism was, you know, no different than what Trump supporters accused rioters of doing during the Black Lives Matter summer protest. We could be sitting in a different place as it relates to the insurrection. None of those things happened. And so um, they're just as valuable sources in the sense that we know tweets were sent out endearing to the insurrectionists, showing love and affection for what they had just done, uh, which was violate many counts of law, uh, district and federal. Uh, um, and so, yeah, I mean, the sources, the type of sources has evolved, but the impact has not. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting you talk about the, um, you know, the Trump tweets, but I haven't thought about that angle of the Trump tweets that could have been, but weren't. Uh, the, the times when he could have tweeted or could have done something. And so instead of having a source to look at, we have this kind of gap or a hole there where maybe the story could have unfolded differently um, had there been some kind of communication produced um, in that. So looking at the events of January 6th, which is where edition 10 basically left off. And a lot is evolving now, almost day by day. I mean, from the time you wrote the 11th edition to now, I mean, we're finding out new information constantly. Um, but how heavily did the events of January 6th feature in edition 11 of the book? Uh, and what sources specifically have you drawn from to include? Well, Congresswoman Cheney's speech in response to the events of the 6th, to the interruption of the normal order, um, you know, that is, I think, important and perhaps foreshadowing a more active role she will play, regardless of whether these hearings result in formal charges or the Justice Department initiates formal charges for President Trump's role in, in the insurrection. I think that um, for, for Congresswoman Cheney, it, it, a lot of times people related Margaret Chase Smith and her warning about active uh, McCarthyism going on and um, the blacklisting of people who were ideologically different and uh, accusing people of being socialists or communists during the Cold War. So that comparison has been made to, you know, anytime someone, whether it was Senator Flake or at, at times Senator Collins, and in many cases, I think it was inaccurate. You know, it was, it was the um, wishful thinking that there would be someone in the Republican Party. I mean, I think Senator McCain in his vote against the, the Republican repeal of the Affordable Care Act was the closest thing to the embodiment of the Margaret Chase Smith. Um, but now you have Congresswoman Cheney who 
uh, is kind of playing that role and, and, and even more formidable in the active investigation of, you know, the alleged criminal activities um, and now demonstrated criminal activities of the insurrectionists. So um, the, they are featured in the context of the articles of impeachment and then the subsequent Liz Cheney speech responding to this unprecedented event. There had been times in American history when the predecessor of the incoming incumbent, right, the, the president transitioning into office, declined to attend the inauguration. I think there were three on record, and then um, this was the fourth, or there had been two on record, and this was the third. Um, this was the first time that you can say, if you're being intellectually honest about Donald Trump, it was the first time that a president was impeached twice. It was also the first time that there was a sitting US president who intentionally disrupted um, the legal transfer of power. Um, and, and I think anybody who is questioning whether because he was not physically in the chamber at that time or because Vice President Pence did not do what he asked Vice President Pence to do, that somehow that, that does not equate to a violation of the peaceful transfer of power. I think that that's not being intellectually honest. His tweets, his speech, his top lawyer's speech, uh, com um, combat by trial, trial by combat, uh, Mayor Giuliani, you know, egging on these insurrectionists who were known to be carrying, you know, weapons. I mean, there's just no denying that the tweets, the speech, and then the act of imploring them to reverse the outcome um, all equated to this unprecedented thing, which I examine relative to other presidential transitions in our history. That was truly unprecedented. Uh, even during the Civil War, we didn't have a period when there was a, a president uh, elect or a, a challenger to an incumbent who intentionally disrupted the order of business and, uh, and, and why people take it seriously. Because for all these years, decades, and now centuries, America has prided itself on the peaceful transfer of power. We've heard that it became cliche and it didn't happen this time. And just because there wasn't a, you know, a massacre or an atrocity uh, does not mean there were violations, uh, you know, that these violations were somehow less important. Uh, they are as important because they were disrupting this process that is you know, really intended to be um, you know, the, the model of the world, even though you know, we know that there were developing republics prior to the United States. In the modern history of democracy, we, in our Declaration of Constitution, started something that was not pervasively practiced. And I think that's interesting. It makes me think of two questions as a follow-up. So I'll give you kind of a double-barreled one. But first, um, how do you make the call in terms of you look at a big event like January 6th and in this information age, uh, there's just a wealth of you know tweets and statements and everything you can choose from. How do you make the call between what should make it into the book versus what you might separate out and not focus on? And then the second part is then, you know, what things do you think we can learn from your examination of January 6th and these original source documents um, that would be different to what we see through media and socials? Hmm. Great questions. You know, let me start with the first. The, the, the selection process um, I share with my editor at Penguin, my thought process, she was very clear that she thought 
the events of the last four years warranted a new update, even though our last was 2017, that that time was was of the essence to get something out there about the pandemic. Um, and I think also about the increasing conservative majority on the Supreme Court and in the, even though this was published, this was written well before the Roe v. Wade overturning, but, uh, but in, the, in the chapter, I, I basically say this is gonna happen, um, you know, in other words. So, I mean, it's, it's as current and timeless as it possibly could be. I, 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 I'm, I'm not uh, clairvoyant, but I, but I did my best and I think it was, it was reflecting the documents that would be studied by American pupils in classrooms and in college lecture halls. That's really the criteria. That was my grandfather's criteria. That's my criteria. At the time he started this book, there weren't really the textbooks that we consider. There was an Encyclopedia Britannica, but there wasn't a, a an Alan Brinkley textbook or a David Kennedy textbook or a Gary Nash textbook, you know, some of the, the titans of American uh, historical writing and thinking. People read biographies. I mean, they read full biographies of, of politicians. They read the diaries of politicians. And so at the time he conceived this in the 1950s, this was intended to be, um, you know, the highlights, in effect, sort of the, the crib notes, the spark notes, the Wikipedia for US history, um, because there was Britannica, but it was in these big, heavy volumes, and you weren't going to bring it to class every day, and you weren't going to own it. You'd, you know, you'd probably read them in, at the library, and there was no digitized version of it. So this was before there were any US history textbooks. The, the documentary history of the United States was that. And so he thought of it from that perspective of what ought to be the teachable documents. And so I can say that reflecting on the pandemic and the millions of lives lost, that that, that New England Journal of Medicine essay, I think will likely surface in a document-based question that at least in grade school in the United States, they are DBQs and the document-based questions that you have to, as a student, answer the question, basically with, with, with kind of finding, uh, spying on the evidence that's in the document. It might be a photo, it might be an excerpt from an essay. And so um, I think that that will likely belong in some document-based uh, question, as will, I think, some of the testimony of the social media executives who were responsible for a lot of the disinformation, misinformation that were uh, so prolific on these sites. That was from the 10th edition. Um, the testimony of these executives basically saying, you know, yeah, we didn't know who funded ads on these platforms. We didn't know who was using these platforms. And uh, Senator Richard Burr, you know, reminding these people, you know, basically they were in violation of the law, the FEC and other statutes in the US that all of these you know, currencies were being funding the manipulation of ads without any disclosures for a whole presidential election cycle. Um, so I think that will end up as, as a source in some document-based question. Uh, Liz Cheney's speech remains to be seen, how active she will uh, be in, in uh, pursuing justice in the case of the insurrection. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and so to me, those those represent examples of what folks ought to study for the most fundamental, um, sometimes rudimentary, but most fundamental understanding of, of this period. The second question is kind of related, what they might learn differently or how they might learn differently as a result of these questions. Well, one of the things about this book is that it's a political, cultural, military, and media history. Um, there's, there are documents in this book that you would not find in, in Howard Zinn's book. Um, there are documents in this book that you would not find in your, like I said, your Brinkley Nash or um, Kennedy textbook. Um, there are documents that, for example, talk about the influence of, of, of 
a media on political decision making. And um, that is not something that is really analyzed sufficiently. Um, but we know that media contributed to and was the platform on which a lot of decisions have been made, whether it's President Obama announcing his campaign and then deploying YouTube videos and the Yes We Can ads that was you know, a central part of his platform or Trump's Twitter account. Um, you know, so the, the idea of, of, I think too often these history books decouple the US from the celebrity centric entertainment orientation that has been seeping through our bloodstream as a result of modern communications. And, and let me just add, as a side note, you know, those of us who want to think about the influence of communications understand that we have a federal communications body here that has essentially been defunct. It exists, but it exists in name only because at a certain point, uh, as a result of the Reagan revolution and the threat posed to conservative talk radio, um, this body of the FCC uh, was afraid to take on any kind of concern as, as the, you know, maybe with the exception of Janet Jackson at the Super Bowl, right? I mean, you know, they're, they're, and, and uh, but the reality we know is that the antitrust um, provisions in EU countries and, um, you know, even maybe not to the extent as, as the EU, but in Australia and New Zealand also. The United States has not practiced communications um, oversight, uh, not censorship, but any sort of classification for a long, long time. Likewise, it's almost as if Theodore Roosevelt never existed. And, and I mean, it was, it was really a challenge for him to trust bust then. And today there's virtually no trust busting. I mean, we think of, of AT&T, Bell, Microsoft, I mean, but in this last decade or two decades, the United States has had very little um, when it come has done very little when it comes to any kind of, um, um, control over its communications and business infrastructure. Um, and the result is our current, uh, I read a book and reviewed it for USA Today years ago, Cannibal Capitalism. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's another question in and of itself. I think the 10th edition really addressed the formation of this cannibal capitalism, the lack of antitrust practice, um, the lack of any kind of communications value system that the country wanted to think about what's going on the internet, you know, and, and, um, and so it may be a net positive that there's never been any regulation of the internet uh, in terms of people's access to information. It may be a, a a net negative, but as a society, I think the, a documentary history reflects this history far more uh, accurately. Whereas in these other books, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like we're in a different country, yet you're not gonna tell people we're in a different country. I, I think that's a really fascinating point. And to be honest, I think one of my favorite things about the book, um, is the fact that not only does the content of the book itself uh, look at the whole of the, you know, U.S. history, um, but it the book it itself has evolved, you know, since the 1950s. These editions have changed. So it has really chronicled these changes in history and these changes to the nation, which I think make it really fascinating to study um, and a great way to kind of look back almost if a scientist was, you know, doing their sampling and looking at the stratification and how old is this? So it's kind of what I feel like this book does both in the content itself and in the different editions. And one of the trends that we've 
looked at a lot here at the U.S. Study Center um, in our polling is that we've chronicled the growing uh, polarization and divisiveness in America. Um, and in sharp contrast to the level of general concur concurrence that we have here in Australia, often on really big heated issues, um, but yet events in the U.S. can often trigger a response here in Australia. So we saw protests across capital cities here in Australia uh, in response to the recent Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, and, you know, and when we've done polling regarding opinions on abortion as a personal choice, between the two major parties here in Australia, we have kind of a 19 point difference between them. Whereas when we did that same polling of Americans, there's a 53 point difference between the two parties in terms of, you know, do you believe that abortion should be a matter of personal choice? Um, or even if you look at COVID restrictions, um, you know, the majority of Biden voters said that restrictions had not gone far enough. Uh, the majority of Trump voters uh, said they went too far. But nearly 70 percent of all major parties in Australia said they're about right. Uh, and there's that just general level of consensus. Uh, have you seen the shift toward polarization over time in your examination of U.S. primary source documents? That's another good question. You know, yes, I think you can see it. I think you can see it in the vitriol. Uh, you know, when I visit with students, uh, which pre-COVID I did often, and hopefully this fall I'll be able to do more um, you know, I talk about the, the, the three V's, you know, the vile, vitriol, vindictiveness of, um, of the political discourse. And, and there were certainly elements of it that predated Donald Trump, but you use the word unvarnished about my book and its history. And, you know, there was something unvarnished and, and intentional about that, um, that discourse. Um, and that also was a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, you can look at Andrew Jackson and you can look at Andrew Johnson, um, the two AJs, uh, and you can find um, the kind of uh, hate um, and, uh, and you know, you can, you can certainly find it in, in other representatives of across the political spectrum, but in terms of the top of the ticket, the person who has the most you know, authority and the most opportunity um, to use the bully pulpit, I think that it was most in, enforced by Donald Trump. Um, and I think that um, the backlash against President Obama because of his race, uh, and maybe because of his novelty in some way to, um, you know, that that the, was an undercurrent of, of the of the of the Tea Party, and then it became more and more explicit in, in terms of the exploitation of, of that uh, you know that fiction, uh, the the stigma associated with his. You know, the question of, of where he was born and even though we know where he was born and we know the facts that was all intentional and and if you're going to run on an, a far-right xenophobic platform that is revving up people who hadn't voted republican for for some years they didn't vote for you know romney or george w bush you know, th there was certainly a new electorate um, that he was tapping into in a very explicit way from that first speech uh, condemning, you know, Mexicans as rapists. Um, so I think that um, while the United States has been mired in impasse when it comes to some of our fundamental public policy, especially domestic policy decisions, um, and that there's been a lot of laziness, a lot of one-mindedness one or one-sidedness on issues, refusal to compromise on the kind of third rail issues, um, that, that it was 
it was more that it was less malevolence and more laziness and kind of, um, again, racist tactics have been used in American politics through, through and through. But I think that in the case of this last decade and the divisiveness, a lot of it um, is represented in, in the Trump, you know, the Trump phenomenon, at least of the way he was talking to the country um, and, and, you know, castigating people. Um, and, uh, and that was, as a politician, you know, that was a, a new experience for our country in recent years. What was not new, I'll just close by saying this, was having folks appointed to positions of power who were cultivating an ideological change on issues. And the overturning of Roe v. Wade is a great example of this. We know that it was three Trump appointed justices, but also uh, justices appointed by President H.W. Bush and President W. Bush, uh, Thomas Scalia, uh, well, not Scalia, but in this case, Thomas, Alito, and Roberts. Um, so you can't um, separate uh, the fact that on a question like abortion, if you view it as a human right and you view the attack on a human right as repressive, um, you can't really separate that from the previous trajectory of conservative Republicans. And we all know that in public surveys in the United States, uh, the vast majority of women and the overall majority of the country favor access to reproductive health. And we were just starting to see, and I expect we'll see a lot more of the tyranny of the minority, right? Because they're the majority on the Supreme Court, but they're actually the minority when it comes to public sentiment. And this won't be the first issue. It wasn't the last issue. There were issues in previous court terms where the, so I think that in this respect, the divisiveness arises from a certain kind of discourse that is, that I've talked about an uncivil, uh, that's really stemming from a kind of bigotry but also we can't look at how policies have captured our institutions of governing. Uh, and, and you can say, you know, for instance, someone who might not really understand the three branches of government, even in our own country, would say, oh, the Democrats have control of the government. They have the control of all branches. It's not true. Not only do the Republicans control the ultimate law of the land right now, or at least conservatives, they, they control the one branch that can override the other two branches with the click of a pen, because we know, you know, signage of a pen or the click of a, of a keyboard with the Supreme Court that's been largely virtual since the pandemic started. Um, so I think in those two respects, you have to look at the discourse and the policy decisions and it is in those respects where you can assess the divisiveness and, and see, you know, it's, it's kind of underpinnings and origins. I think it's a really interesting point, um, you know, talking about the balance of power and looking at how that is spread at the moment across the three kind of branches of government. And a lot of this is reminding me of my, you know, high school U.S. government days and, you know, thinking through those branches. One of the things that came to mind uh, was the whole concept of um, majority rule and minority rights, but how through the Supreme Court at the moment, we're seeing something really different. Um, and I think, if anything, uh, through the way that this has unfolded, it shows the real difference between uh, a policy position that's uh, achieved through legislation versus a policy decision that's achieved through um, the justice system and a ruling of some sort. And I think that'll be a, a lesson going forward. But I think this dynamic that we have set up between the Supreme Court and Congress and the White House, it's in a very interesting dynamic right now. Um, and one other thing about the recent ruling, which is too new for the book, but I think one of the things that came to mind for me was with the ruling, we saw the eyes of the world, not just America, but the world turn to a primary source document 
with the leaked draft majority opinion of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, I mean, everyone wanted to go and look at the original um, and the fact that then that was up there and available. Very fascinating. I mean, what impact do you think this has on the public discourse when people are looking at the text of a document itself, um, albeit a draft version of it? Well, I'll just keep it short and sweet, and then I'd love to take some questions. Um, you know, honestly, what it reveals is that the, the justices who were supporting reproductive access should have justified it on the basis of the First Amendment. Um, I actually recently interviewed the president of Columbia University, who was the dean of University of Michigan Law School at the time that Justice O'Connor ruled in favor of institutions being able to use affirmative action, uh, uh, include race in their decision-making around enrollment. You're probably wondering the connection. Well, affirmative action and abortion have been, you know, along with school prayer, the kind of third rails that the court has been poised to tackle. And I asked President Bollinger, now, why is it the case that, that these schools that are now having to, private and public, in the case of Harvard and the University of North Carolina, having to defend their selection processes, why aren't they using the First Amendment? Um, we know how conservatives feel that big business can really use the First Amendment as it sees fit to have the same rights espoused um, on behalf of, of citizens. Um, and when I think of reproductive choice, I think of no, you know, I think of no more intimate expression of individualism than being able to carry through with, with a pregnancy or not. Um, and so I think what this means is that for the last 30 years, at least, conservatives have taken ownership of what the First Amendment ought to mean. And uh, the liberals were looking, or again, conservatives, liberals, people may see them differently, the textualists versus the, the living constitutionalists. Um, you know, the, the, I think the trouble is that, that the argument for, for Roe um, was, was less grounded in the text of, of, you know, the constitution, let alone the first amendment. And, I, and so to answer your question, the text is really important. And what it shows um, is how you can, if you don't like a ruling, you can go back to the original source material and say, no, I think it means this. And as long as there's an original source material and you don't live under a dict dictatorship, you are in a position to do that. Mm, yeah. Very interesting. All right, I'm going to turn to some audience questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box um, and the bottom of your Zoom. Um, so this first one, I think is it's interesting. I am going to pivot it a little bit, but it says, you know, how was Russia able to influence the 2016 U.S. elections and what has been done to prevent a recurrence? Um, but I think, you know, linking it to your book, um, I think, again, it kind of comes down to what might the role of primary sources have to do um, as we as we look at uh, you know the commentary around elections, or does is there a role to play uh, for looking at original documents or the kind of content we have in your book in terms of countering the sort of influence uh, we have seen and are likely to see in future elections as well? I mean, absolutely. I, I would hope that our book is a book of record, uh, a book that is as trustworthy as those early Britannica editions or Wikipedia, which you know, at the time people wondered, what could it be? Professors were doubting its veracity and whether it should be something that can be cited. To this day, I'm sure there are a lot of academics who uh, ask their students not to cite Wikipedia. But my, my point is that I, I hope that the book counteracts dis and misinformation. And, and I, I think the most important thing in analyzing it is, is always trying to understand what the motivation of um, disinformation is, because there, there is misinformation that, you know, or facts that you might not get right at the time um, that were, was not a deliberate act of 
uh, trying to mislead, and then there are acts of purposefully um, misleading people. And I, I just think that that's the most important thing to try to understand in, as it relates to Russian disinformation or any sort of disinformation in the future, which is what is the misinformation and what is the disinformation? Um, and, uh, and using documents to counteract this dis and misinformation, I mean, is, is really the rule, the first principle of trying to find sources to say, okay, here are five sources, you know, from, from five different ideological places on the spectrum, and they, and they all disagree with this, right? I mean, you take Paul Krugman, if you talk about from the, the United States perspective of the economy, you know, you get Paul Krugman, William F. Buckley, Milton Friedman in, the, in a room, that's three, you can name five more, uh, Larry Summers, uh, and uh, pick your favorite economist, U.S. economist. And, uh, and, you know, if you can find attributions to all of them that are making some basic point that you want to make, well, then you have agreement among, you know, ideological difference. And I think that's important. So I would say, that piece of it's important. Um, when I was in Australia speaking at Macquarie and in your university in 2017, I talked extensively about the um, Honest Ads Act, which is legislation that's been proposed, it hasn't passed, and the importance of on screen disclosures because, in you know, the difference between getting your information online and in books is that there are requirements for sourcing and uh and online you might not even know who's sharing information with you and from the american perspective back in 2017 in the aftermath of the 2016 election i was particularly passionate about uh senator klobuchar senator warner and the late senator mccain's legislation on the subject because still to this day anticipating the 2024 election and then you know more um immediately the 2020 midterms you know you can you can publish ads um, that are visually deceptive on any of these platforms, um, and um, there are baby steps that Facebook and Twitter have taken, and um, you know. But but certainly, in in most platforms, you're going to continue to to find um, a lack of disclosure in video content that's being fed to you. And, um, and, that, and that is problematic. So I, I think I would answer the question in those terms about the kinds of documents because written words, especially published written words are held to a much higher standard of accountability than streaming videos online. Yeah, that's great. And another question that kind of picks up on something we've discussed already, but I'm hoping maybe you can give a specific example. Um, but does history show there is a precedent, a precedent uh, for the level of political polarization we see in America today? Um, you mentioned, you know, the two AJs, you know, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Johnson. Um, are there moments that you would highlight to say this moment I mean, aside from the Civil War, <laughs> uh, are there moments in, you know, the U.S. political discourse that you would say kind of parallel or are comparable to what we see today? Yeah, I, I think I think there are in the sense that there were decisions that were made um, that were reexamined. Um, the Dred Scott decision is one of them that's in the book, um, someone once asked me, why is the Dred Scott decision in your book? Again, this is not a celebration. This is a history. Um, so, you know, some at the time would have celebrated that uh, to show how backwards things were. In a sense, this is, especially with this update, um, you know, it was important to reflect in our history that we have been a very exclusive people at stages. So the inclusion of the Chinese Exclusion Act as a document in this book, there were, there were three race-based exclusionary pieces of legislation starting in the 1890s, the late 1890s, going through the mid, you know, 1920s. And, 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 uh, and, and they were, you know, as bigoted as saying, 
we are going to exclude X race because we associate them with criminal activity. Again, Trump's statement in the his announcement. And so people shouldn't have said, man, this guy's not going to get elected. Look at what he's saying in that speech. Uh, separate from the theatrics, it actually has a place in the longstanding history when there were movements of xenophobia, uh, of racism. Um, so I think that there is an arc and it, you know, there, there is a pendulum that swings um, when it comes to ideology. Um, and, you know, and from that perspective, I think um, you find commonality in some of the documents and some of the feelings of grievance and Supreme, whether that's manifest in elections of, of individuals or Supreme Court decisions. And picking, picking up on that and those contentious moments in history, this is a question we received via Twitter. Um, about 150 years ago, the U.S. fought a civil war, and now we see a country riven by division. So the SCOTUS overturning pre settled precedents, the EPA rulings, um, unable to address endemic gun violence. But this part is the question, how can any one figure heal the divisions? Um, how, how do you think there, and maybe to put a little bit of a hopeful spin at the end of the webinar, um, you know, is, is there a role that can be played um, in terms of the things the public figures do that can help to heal the divides and bring more unity? Yeah, I'm actually working on a new series um, of interviews that's attempting to do that, but I'm discovering how hard it is to do that. Uh, I mean, a lot of it comes from the, the, the blessing and curse of federalism in, in, in the United States. You know, you guys have various states too. And it was impressed upon me at, at the time that I was visiting with you all that the Murdoch empire um, was taking sides. Uh, and, and when it comes to, you know, the, the position of the people on, any number of issues and that that was um, engendering uh, a degree of controversy, if not divisiveness or division. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, your individual states and cities have differences too. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the vastness of difference in the United States is at a, at a different level. Um, and I think um, that has to do with a more diverse history. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think it has to do with um, the way in which both the individual and the state have, have become so, it, so um, the, the citizen and the state have become in a sense individualized, right? Um, I think, the, the essence of America, rugged individualism, is still apparent in how individuals govern on whether that's the municipal level, or the state level, or the federal level. So I think we have a lot, we have more entanglements in institutions as well as more entanglements in the diversity of the melting pot experience. Um, and I think that we are going to discover and may discover the hard way um, that you can't have um, institutions that are so dysfunctional and that handicap you from persevering or progressing um, and, and not consider significant overhaul. Um, so, you know, and, and so I think this speaks to the tyranny of the minority that I mentioned. It speaks to how and under what conditions you can govern and which um, state governors are acting, um, you know, separate and 180 degrees apart from other state governors. Uh, we've had that in our history before. Um, you know, when there were governors who didn't want to desegregate schools. Um, so it's not like we haven't grappled with it, but some of our institutions 
are intrinsically anti-democratic or undemocratic now. I mean, I'm thinking of the Electoral College. I'm thinking of the representation in the Senate. Um, and, you know, I've heard arguments from, from friends and from people who live in states that are underrepresented that that's the way that the founders intended it. Um, it was not just that they wanted to represent people, but they wanted to represent, you know, these states. And, and even if a state has fewer people, they wanted it to have an equal an equal share. Well, the, the United States Senate and the United States of House of Representatives were in fact supposed to balance um, state power and um, you know, representative uh, power. And I don't know that that equation is, is adding up anymore. If the, if the outcomes are going to be increasingly anti or undemocratic, I think that that will be problematic. Um, so, I, you know, in, in, in thinking about hopefulness of, of bringing together compromise and bipartisanship, it's a lofty goal. I think we, we all have to understand um, our basic humanity and have compassion for each other. And also recognize, you know, politics is not just the art of the possible, but it's the art of survival. And the art of survival means having clean drinking water and, and air and you know, making decisions that are going to prevent crime rather than increase crime. You know, all those are acts of governing and, and they're not in some abstract you know, pantheon or something that is not accessible to the public. And I, I always like to, to you know, emphasize that and I'm glad I can close with that that idea. Tip O'Neill said all politics is, is local, but I don't think that went far enough in understanding that that's the former House Speaker from Massachusetts. In understanding the significance of, of political decision making as integral to life and death, and we know that well as New Yorkers and the aftermath of 9-11 and decisions that we had to take as a country. So, I mean, there's definitely hope for unity and, and I think that if we're honest with each other, we have to, we have to say that the, the, the reason we're hopeful about humanity, humanity and unity is because we share certain values of you know, wanting our families to thrive, wanting our loved ones to thrive. And you know, if we can start on that basis, you know, that, then I think we may not need to have the radical institutional reform that would make the, the constitution a more majoritarian document or a fairer document or you know, more equitable document. I think that, that um, if we can simply have more debates that start from that point of common interests and values, then um, that much more difficult path of securing those uh, blessings and liberties through constitutional change, you know, that, 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 that path is the more accessible path to us. And, and, and I think to be frank, if it gets to the point of having to change the constitution, um, you know, the, the, I think the likelier we will not just be divided in, in word, but in deed only, you know, not just word, but in deed. And I, I don't want to see that divisiveness manifest even more than it is today, because we know that there are episodes of that divisiveness today in, in, um, in shootings and assassinations and things that occur um, in the U.S., in terms of gun violence fairly regularly. And, you know, there have been slowly more examples of where that has been politically motivated, whether it's the Capitol Gazette shooting in Maryland or the pipe bomb sent to elected officials in 2018. Um, and so I, I think that we want to avoid going down the most confrontational or controversial approach. Um, that doesn't mean you, you can't, for example, add seats to the United States Supreme Court uh, without a backlash, 
uh, of, of that nature. I mean, I think that the first thing is having the conversation. The first thing is having a conversation about the, the, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, right? Because the, the Supreme Court seems intent right now on deciding everything and everyone's lives. And, uh, and I think that if the shoe were on the other foot, a lot of conservatives would say, oh, we don't want the Supreme Court to have this vast jurisdiction of deciding that. Um, and maybe we can reach a happy medium ultimately. Um, and, and, and it's true that the, the imbalance on the Supreme Court you know, has tilted us so far in the other direction um, after some precedents were established that it's, it, is, it is concerning. Um, but I think if people are gonna contemplate changes to the basic structure of government, even if it's a change like adding seats to the Supreme Court, which doesn't require any constitutional action, that's an act of Congress, we have to have conversations about it and understand each other's perspectives and what it means to be underrepresented if you were in a state where your, the laws were not going your way for many, many years. We still have to have those conversations. Um, yeah, well, I think it's fascinating. And thank you for moving toward a, a more hopeful note for us um, at the end of the welcome. webinar. Thank you so much, Alexander, for your time today. It's been a pleasure to discuss these salient and critical issues with you. Um, and if you in the audience are either a history or a news junkie like me, uh, I want to encourage you to keep an eye out for the book. Um, it's available to pre-order on Amazon Australia and also Dimmix Online. Um, and maybe we can get an Australian edition in the future where you look at Australian <laughs> primary source documents. I think it would be a fascinating story to examine this parallel democracy. Um, and please stay tuned for more USSC webinars coming up. Last week, we announced uh, our new Director of Foreign Policy and Defense, Professor Peter Dean from UWA, will be joining us in August. Um, and we look forward to introducing him to our online audience as well. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. Thank you for hosting me. <laughs>